Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the second webinar of a four-part series developed in collaboration with the National Head Start Association, Scott's miracle Grow Foundation, and Kids Gardening. Um, we're really excited that all of you are really interested in learning more about this Grow More Garden Grants initiative and how to incorporate gardens into your Head Start, Early Head Start, or any other early care and education programs. Um, but before we begin, I would actually like to give a few quick tech reminders just to ensure we all get the most out of this quick one-hour webinar. Um, we would love as much engagement as possible and would encourage you to use the question and comments, box, comments boxes on your webinar toolbar. Um, we will address your questions throughout the webinar when possible, but we also have dedicated Q&A time at the end of the webinar. Um, and because of the number of people that have joined this webinar, we want to encourage you to use the question and comments boxes instead of using that hand raising icon that you see on your toolbar, um, just so we can see all the questions that come in. And it's really difficult to kind of see who has their icon raised with so many people. Um, so we're definitely going to address your questions um, either during the webinar or at the Q&A time at the end. Um, and if we are unable to, uh, at the end, we'll make sure that we'll follow up via email after the webinar. Um, we're also going to have several polls and questions throughout the webinar so we can learn as much as possible from you guys in attendance and how you all plan to move forward with planting your gardens. Um, so please participate in all those polls when they're provided on your screen so we can learn as much from you as possible. And now I would like to provide a little bit more information about the National Head Start Association and this exciting partnership we have uh, for the Grow More Gardens Grants Initiative. So, First of all, my name is Sarah Neal, uh, Manager of Effective Practice at the National Head Start Association. Um, and the National Head Start Association is this nonprofit organization committed to the belief that every child, regardless of circumstances at birth, has the ability to succeed in life. And NHSA is a voice for more than 1 million children, 200,000 staff, and 1,600 uh, Head Start grantees in the United States. So since 1974, NHSA has worked diligently for policy changes that ensure all at-risk children have access to the Head Start model of support for the whole child, the family, and the community. NHSA's vision is to really lead and advocate for children and families across the country to ensure that all vulnerable children and families have what they need to succeed. But along with our strong advocacy efforts, we also provide six professional development conferences throughout the year, share resources and tools on topics most relevant to our field, do webinars and trainings and blogs and media outreach. Um, and we also provide opportunities for idea sharing and peer-to-peer -peer learning on our online communities. But one of our most exciting partnerships um, has really allowed us to combine all of these efforts to expand our work around nutrition and gardening and overall Head Start health and wellness. So, our partnership with Scott's miracle Grow Foundation and Kids Gardening has been really exciting and successful thus far, and we're really excited to continue this for two more years. So now I'm going to turn it over um, to Carol Nolan from the Scott's miracle Grow Foundation to provide a little more detail about the foundation and some goals for the Grow More Garden Grants Initiative. Carol? Great. Yeah, great. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Carol Nallen, and I'm the Corporate Social Responsibility Manager for the Scott's miracle Grow Company. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody today, um, and I will just give you a quick overview of our company and our foundation's community outreach initiatives and grant-making programs. Uh, so we have three main buckets of investment that we make. Uh, we do a lot of effort in protecting our nation's water supplies and conserving scarce water resources. We also work to protect pollinators um, through a variety of programs. And then, of course, um, gardens and green spaces. And I am really proud of our partnership with the NHSA and Kids Gardening. I'm excited to see how we're going to achieve our collective goal of bringing more gardens to more children everywhere. Um, our company really does truly and strongly believe in the life enhancing benefits of gardens and the positive impact they have on people's lives. And we really are focusing in over the next several years on helping young children and children who are um, less well served or falling through the cracks um, in America and helping connect them especially with these benefits. We know there are nutritional, physical, so, social, emotional, and academic benefits that a garden can provide. And through this partnership, we want to see more and more children experience these benefits. That's really what, you know, why we're all here today. 
Um, so over the next three years, our foundation partnership, as Sarah said, will be providing garden grants, garden kits and product donations, garden training, such as the webinar we're on today, and other educational resources to head starts all across the country. And um, we, we really value this partnership, knowing that um, both NHSA and Kids Gardening bring uh, 40 plus years of experience to leading this movement. Um, and you'll benefit from hearing directly from Sarah Pounders um, and Helen Rortvet from Kids Gardening today as well. Um, just before I hand things over, I'll give you a little bit of a snapshot of the Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation. So our mission is to inspire, connect, and cultivate a community of purpose. And as I said, we focus our work in creating healthier communities, empowering the next generation, and preserving the planet, especially through water and pollinator initiatives. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we are funded um, entirely by the Scott's Miracle Grow Company. Scott's Miracle Grow has been in existence uh, for 150 years. We celebrated our uh, anniversary last year, and we have a rich history of working to bring gardens and green spaces to more people and more communities. As the largest marketer of lawn and garden products in the world, we really take seriously our responsibility to give back to communities however we can. And uh, now I think I'll hand things over to Helen. Great, thank you so much, Carol. Um, my name is Helen Rortvet, and I'm the Executive Director of Kids Gardening. Um, and I just wanna echo um, our gratitude for being a part of this partnership. Um, it's been really exciting for us to work with the Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation and the NHSA team so far this year. Um, and we're really looking forward to um, the next couple of years of working together. So Kids Gardening's mission is to ensure that all kids have access to a garden in which to play, learn, and grow. Um, we really believe in the transformative power of, of garden-based learning, um, and we see it as sort of a great equalizer. It's something that's accessible to um, kids of all ages all across the country and of all sorts of economic means, um, physical ability, you know, cultural, um, so there's all it's just a really wonderful space to bring everyone together um, and we achieve our mission through inspiring and supporting educators and families um, we provide grants and curriculum lots of lesson plans and activities if you're looking for some ideas for what to do with the kids out in the garden lots of resources on our website um, and really what we are working to do is creating um, a network and a community of empowered ambassadors such as yourselves. So we're really um, glad that you've come to the table to learn and to share. Um, and we really hope that we can offer some inspiration and some resources for you moving forward. So thanks so much for having us. Thank you so much, Helen. Yeah, Kids Gardening has some really great resources on their website that we always share as well. So just make sure you're uh, looking through that as you're starting to plan your gardens. Um, but I'm just going to briefly go over the agenda today. Um, we just want to make sure we have enough time for everything else. But um, we're going to have a nice overview um, from Sarah Pounders from Kids Gardening um, about teaching health and wellness through garden programs. And uh, then we'll have two program spotlights, um, which will be really exciting. And then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. But before we move into it, I just want to um, ask a couple of questions to you guys. This first poll, I'm going to go ahead and launch one moment. Um, just to know a little bit more about who is on the webinar today. So I'll just give you guys um, a couple of seconds to fill that out. You should see it on your screen now. Great. It looks like we have a majority of uh, program managers and directors. Let's see. A couple more seconds to fill that out. About 50% of you guys have voted. We have about 40% early childhood educators and staff, 50% program managers and directors, 2% cur curriculum specialists, 1% uh, parents. So I'm glad you're on the call. And then a few other. Great. Thanks so much. I look forward to kind of learning who else is on the call and the other later on. Great. Thank you. We're going to mo move on to the next poll. One second. Um, do you have a garden in your program at the moment? I'll give you a couple of seconds to fill this one out. Great. Looks like a majority of you, or about 30% of you actually now are yes. We have been had a garden for a while. That's really great to hear. About 20% of you are yes, we just started. 25% not yet, but we're planning one. And 30% no, but we are considering one. 
That is really great. I'm just going to give a couple of things to finish that up. Great. Thank you all so much. That's really helpful as we uh, talk through the rest of the webinar today. Um, so now I will go ahead and turn it over to Sarah Poundage from Kids Gardening uh, to uh, guide the rest of the conversation today. Great. Thank you guys so much. Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah, you sound great. Okay, great. Just want to check before I launch into it. So my name is Sarah Pounders, and I'm an education specialist at Kids Gardening. I've been working with gardening with kids for almost 25 years now. And actually, I started out, one of my very first programs was with um, early childhood um, kids, and then, um, and actually with nutrition, too, was one of the my first focus. When I was in graduate school, my um, research was on using uh, school gardens as nutrition education tools. And back then, I can remember how hard it was to find a examples of, of programs and to find the research. And it's been really exciting to see this particular area of school garden um, really grow um, and educational gardens really grow in the last 10 to 15 years. So um, next slide. So what I'm going to kind of just go over today is, um, so what, what are we do, talking about when we define a, a garden that's focused on nutrition or health and wellness, there's really lots of different ways to approach it. Um, the first is just to have an edible garden. So actually just um, allowing the kids to see how to grow the foods, fruits and vegetables that they eat. Um, you may or may not have the opportunity to taste, taste them or um, to cook with them, but at least you have the opportunity for the kids to see where their food comes from. Kind of the next level to that is actually also including a tasting or a cooking program um, in your program. Um, and that's just kind of the next step. And it, it just depends on, and we're going to kind of cover some of the details to that. And then also another health and wellness related program is looking at how it impacts social and emotional health. Um, and that we're actually going to cover. We're going to take that out and cover that in the next um, uh webinar that's going to come up in May. So if you're interested in that aspect of health and wellness, you'll have to hang on for just a little bit more. So let's head into what some of the nutritional benefits are of using the garden as a, as a learning tool. It's on the next slide. So what are some of the benefits um, that have been found to using the garden as a nutrition education tool? First, there have been a number of studies done that show that garden programs can really help change um, young gardeners' attitudes towards fruits and vegetables. It helps improve how they view the fruits and vegetables and, and change their willingness to try them. Um, just because of a lack of time, what I've done is on the handout that you can download, I've actually put a number of links to studies and research studies that have been published over the last year, few years so that you can look those up if you want some more specifics. But um, it's it has been something that, it, although it's a small, it is a growing body of research. Um, next, being able to use a garden, provides fresh fruits and vegetables that you can get when they're you can pick at their peak and so the taste and the texture is often a lot better than what kids have tried in the past so it like lets them really taste the fruits and vegetables at their peak as they pick them so not only are they excited about growing them because they grew them themselves and interested in tasting them once they do taste them they often taste better just because they haven't had to sit in a grocery store or on the truck to get to them a school garden can also increase the availability of fresh fruits and vegetables potentially. It also has great physical activity being outside, both fine and gross motor skills um, and outdoor experiences. And finally, and this is something I'm sure I don't need to tell many of you, is that those habits that you um, establish early in childhood can last a lifetime. So this is just once again a great time um, in the early childhood education time to really reach them with the message. So next slide. So how is having an edible garden different or the same as having a regular school garden? Um, and there are a lot of similarities. And first of all, these are kind of the, the keys to having a successful garden. And specifically, I'll kind of add in some tips that are specific to an edible garden. But you want to start out with a strong leadership team. Um, so, so people that are really going to help keep things going and moving because a garden is is not a one person job by any means. So when you're looking at your leadership team for your edible garden, make sure that you are also including in addition to having educators and administrators and if possible to have students on that team, also make sure that you're including people like your cafeteria, food service staff, um, maybe your nurse, um, local health professionals, if you have a 
people outside of the community. And when you have this leadership team, you can have both people that are there every day that are kind of like your committee that help water and do those things, but also have an advisory committee just to kind of help guide you. So you want to make sure that you're really looking at a broader base of folks when you're doing an edible garden. You still want to make sure that you connect to educational objectives. You want to make sure that it's fitting right in with your curriculum um, and it's not something that's just outside of the curriculum. Um, you want to set realistic and measurable goals. This is very important for an edible garden, especially if you're just getting started. If you think that you're going to be producing enough fruits and vegetables to, to really um, provide for all of your school lunches and to have a farmer's market right out of the get-go, you are probably going to be a little disappointed because it takes time to grow and to harvest that much. So you want to make sure that you're setting realistic um, expectations and that you're being able to measure what you're trying to accomplish. You want to try and integrate it into your school's culture. You want to make sure that it's not something that's outside of extra to your day. You want to put it in with all of the other things that you're doing and have it fit that way. And that way it really helps make, uh, make it not seem like an addition to your day. And finally, start small and expand later. Um, that's my, my number one tip. If you don't listen to anything else, make sure you start small and really get a handle on things and then you can expand over time. So let's go into the next step. Um, so another thing that's kind of different than from an edible garden than just adding a garden program is you really need to pay a little more attention to your safety um, of your site and your soil and your water. So when you're planting your garden, make sure that you learn what the history of your site is. Make sure that you haven't had any hazardous materials in your soil. You can conduct a soil test, and on the handout that I've provided, there is a link to your to local extension office. That's one of the best way to find out who in your community and your state um, is a good place to send off soil test, and I'll have all the information about how to take it and where to send it off to. Um, so that's in that handout. You may also want to test your water source. Um, that's something that has kind of come to light recently that you just don't know um, the pipes that the water might be running through, where you're getting your water from. Um, in general, you don't want to use um, uh, rain barrels necessarily for a water source um, for your edible garden, but that's something that once again, test your water source. We also have a hand in the handout, you'll find a link to an EPA um, flyer that can walk you through that testing procedure. Make sure you assess your surroundings, see what else is going on. Are you somewhere where there people might be spraying or there might be any kind of pollution that might impact your garden? Be careful when you are using compost or composted manures. You want to make sure that everything is has been composted well and safely. And finally, you want to exclude animal visitors um, as much as possible uh, from your garden space. So make sure to, to, to have that um, to the most, um, as safe as you can. Okay, next slide. So there's a lot of different garden um, techniques that you can use when you're doing an edible garden. You don't necessarily need a huge amount of space. You can start out with container gardens. In this picture, you can see that they're growing in five gallon buckets. This is one of my one of the easiest ways that you can get started is to use a, a simple food grade five gallon bucket. You can drill holes in the bottom or you can even cut them in half. One of uh, a great program that we have in the um, Houston, Texas area is called the Cylinder Gardening Program. And it's another one that I have a link to on the handout. And they you cut five gallon buckets in half and they raise fruits and vegetables in those. Um, and then when they get done, you can pick it up and just, um, rake out the, the soil. So um, we have another link to container gardens and the different types of container gardens. And so next slide, I'm going to kind of go through these a little, fa little fast because there are some more resources. Another thing is raised bed gardens. This is the Head Start Gardens at our elementary school that I'm a, the, the garden coordinator for. Uh, we have absolutely no soil. It is all concrete. Um, and so we've gotten these really large raised beds um, that we can grow. You can, once again, we have complete control over the type of soil that goes in. And um, it's really, it's, 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 been a, it's been a good way to add it into a space that normally would not be considered good for growing. So next one. And the last thing that I wanted to just mention is that indoor gardens are also great. You can do a lot of things with fruits and vegetables indoor. This is um, lettuce. You can basically have a salad that you've grown yourself within three to four weeks um, in grow light. So just because you don't have very good outdoor space, don't discount the indoor space that you have available. Next slide. 
So um, when you're doing this, you're going to make sure to look at your plant selection. You want to grow plants that are easy in your area. You want to make sure that you are choosing things that are grow well for you. This, again, is another great place that your extension office can come in uh, and help with. Most of them will have a schedule and some suggested fruits and vegetables that grow well in your area. And you want to kind of plan it around your breaks. Uh, you want to make sure that you have, um, you're paying attention to how you can water it and that kind of thing. If you don't have summer classes, then you probably don't want to plant fruits and vegetables that are going to be harvested during the summer. Um, so it's really one of those things that use your schedule to determine what kind of plants. Use your schedule and the location you have available to determine what kind of fruits and vegetables you grow. Okay, next slide. So here's some easy ones to try that I just to get started if you're thinking about it. Lettuce is usually pretty easy. Radishes, although they may not be superfoods, they usually are a good sure thing. They are ready to harvest in about 30 days, so they're a great way to get started. Beans are good, they're usually easy. They have really large seeds, which are good for small hands. Sugar snap peas are good if you have cooler temperatures. And microgreens, and that is, microgreens are just general, Plants that can be grown indoors and you harvest them when they're very young just and, and can eat them and add them to salads that way. So those are some easy ones to try. So next slide. Another thing about edible gardens is you can really make them fun. There's a lot of cool ideas out there. There's eat a rainbow. Pizza garden, this is an example of a pizza garden at our school where we grow tomatoes and then we have basil, we have peppers in there, we have some chives in there, um, the oregano, it's taking pretty much the tomatoes take over. But we do have all the ingredients to make their own pizza. Salsa garden, salad garden, there's lots of cool books like Tops and Bottoms, Oliver's Vegetables, Stone Soup. So next slide. So I, I don't have much time to get completely into the harvesting aspect of it, but um, one of the things that when you're harvesting, I just want to say that when you're harvesting, you want to think, you often think about food safety when you're in the kitchen and, and when you're preparing the food, but you also need to be uh, thinking about similar things when you're in the garden and harvesting the food. So the kids should wash their hands before they harvest. You may need to make sure to use clean containers and tools. Don't use the same buckets that you use for weeding to also harvest your fruits and vegetables. Make sure that you're, use, you're starting the food safety out in the garden and then you carry it into the kitchen. Also make sure you have healthy gardeners who are harvesting your fruits and vegetables. Next slide. And just to run through some tips about kitchen, I'm not gonna get into it all today, but there are um, some links on the handout that I've provided for you, both from the USDA and I have one from the National um, Farm to School Network and also one from Slow Foods that all has food safety tips for you. Next slide. And some other just things, brief things that I'll mention. If you are doing tasting and cooking programs, send home the recipes ahead of time for approval. Make sure to note for allergies and make sure that you're always um, making sure it's a safe, judgment free atmosphere. So they're making it very non threatening for kids to try the fruits and vegetables. Next. And this one is one of our uh, other education specialists, Christine. She has some suggestions for cooking kits. She goes into Burlington, Vermont schools to do cooking programs, and these are some of her go-tos. This whole list is also available on the handout for you. So next slide. So finally, just want to end by saying, and this is something that I know when I'm talking to Head Start audiences, they completely understand is that Parent involvement is the key. That is one of the things that I've always found through research. It was kind of disappointing as you as you create this wonderful school garden uh, program to try and change people's attitudes about fruits and vegetables is that although you may change their attitudes, actually changing behaviors means that you need to get into the home and get parents to also adopt and help uh, foster those good behaviors. So make sure that you're involving parents at every step of the way with your edible garden too, so that it really makes long lasting changes. So we'll move on to that next. Sorry for, for running through this so quickly, but I wanna make sure that I give plenty of time for our program spotlights because they have been out and they know from firsthand experience, they're gonna share with you some of the, the things they've learned about creating some edible gardens. First up, we have Child Start Inc. in Kansas. We have Andrew and Amy, and they're gonna talk about their most recent project, uh, the Lorax Garden. And they're kind of at the beginning of it. They were Youth Garden Grant winners from last year and we're really, really excited. Um, they've done a great creative process and I know they've got a lot to share. So I'm gonna turn it over to you guys. 
All right. Can everybody hear me? Hopefully. Uh, yeah, we hear you fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so my degree is in uh, human nutrition. So that's how I ended up being a nutrition coordinator. I didn't have much child experience. Um, I, this is my third school year. And one of the things I really wanted to get going just because of a, a personal interest was was gardening. And I Amy, we can't. I'm so sorry, Amy. We cannot hear you. Um, we thought we heard a Andrew fine, but we cannot hear you, Amy. Okay, sorry. Um, my, sorry, um, I'm the manager here in Augusta Head Start, and this is my third school year. Next, we hear slide. you great now. Okay, next slide. Can we go to the? Okay, we figured out where our microphone is, but it's still that they're in a same room. Uh, so we're just going to do a highlight on, on Butler County. Our whole company here is. Whoops. Hi, Andrew. I'm so sorry. We barely hear you. You're going in and out. Um, if you can go okay. back to where you're speaking. Yeah, now I hear you. You hear me better? Yes. Okay. Can we just go to the next slide? Yes. This slide? Yes. Okay, so our company name is Child Start Inc. Uh, we're based out of Wichita, Kansas. We've got 10 centers. We've got centers between 17 kids all the way up to 100, and we cover three different counties. Uh, at any time, we're working with up to 500 or more children and families. Uh, we've got some home-based programs, and then staff, we have over 200. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, Sorry, Amy, we can Amy, we cannot hear you. We hear you occasionally, um, but only a few words here and there. Okay, I'm gonna do this slide. We're gonna have to switch chairs. Uh, she, she, her slides come mostly at the end, so I'll just cover this one. Um, and then you'll you'll hear from Amy after I finish. Uh, so we've got two centers in Butler County, and those were the centers that we wrote a grant through Kids Gardening for. Um, and we wound up being one of the the finalists for that with a proposal for Lorax Gardens. Uh, one thing we'll, we'll say there, we wound up a national finalist, which sounds really impressive. Uh, six months before that, we had applied for a garden grant and uh, did not receive one. So uh, what I'd say, you know, if you are looking at grants out there, uh, just, you know, remember you're going to see a lot of rejection. Don't let that bog you down too much. Just make your next proposal uh, better. And so like with this one, what we did was we had a Lorax tie-in. Uh, so it's going to be a Lorax theme. Uh, and we tested it or we wrote it for just our Butler County centers just because they're some of our smaller centers. They tend to be more stable. We have the same kids in the classrooms for, for longer than we do in Wichita and we don't have as much staff turnover. So they work out really well to, to test something and see if we want to expand it. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, so why did we pick Lorax Gardens? Uh, so Lorax is a, a book from Dr. Seuss. And we have an event already that our company does called Green Eggs and Ham. So we do that every year. This is actually uh, coming up next month is the 25th year that we're, the company's doing this event. So originally it was scheduled around Dr. Seuss's birthday, but it worked out really well that it's around spring break, uh, which is traditionally about the time you start planting in Kansas. Uh, so for us, we already had you know, events where we were gonna have parents coming. And then when we look through you know, what books Dr. Seuss has, uh, we saw that the Lorax, you know, it introduces conversation and being good stewards over your environment. And so that was going to be uh, the book we felt had the, the best tie-in. So that's why we, we wound up with that. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, so what's a Lorax garden? Like, what were we going to define that as? Uh, we were going to have the teachers read Lorax to their students. And then in the book, if you're not familiar with it, the, the picture there is from the book. And so those are called truffle trees. And so those are the, the signature trees of the book. And they are a really useful plant. They get harvested so much that they all end up, um, there are no more of them. And then all the animals go away and the, the environment doesn't look so pretty by the end. Uh, so we knew we were gonna need some truffle trees if we were gonna have Lorax Gardens. Uh, for our Green Eggs and Ham event, they've been, you know, made with with paper crafts and kind of have pom pom tops. So that was an idea we thought about. But I was researching strawberry planting, uh, doing vertical 
you know, PVC pipe planting. Uh, so that's a, a kind of plastic pipe usually used for plumbing, but it's supposed to be really easy to do strawberry gardens in them. Uh, I read multiple articles, I did some research, and then strawberries were are always really popular with our kids. So we decided we were gonna do vertical strawberry uh, planters and those were gonna be our truffle trees. Can we go to the next slide? So then we uh, we have a, a primary grant writer, and so he was talking with me and, and then Amy as well. Uh, so we talked out the key points and, and got writing. We only had actually a couple of days before uh, it was due. We came across this like right towards the due date. Uh, so we had our basic garden plans plotted out, and then we thought out you know what we're actually going to plant. Uh, we had a, a really basic timeline drawn up. Uh, we liked our proposal. We thought it was a, a good creative proposal. We thought having it tied in with our event was going to to make it strong, but um, kind of going against us and our odds, so to speak, we only were going to be including 68 children and families. So it was two of our smaller centers, so we weren't sure uh, what to expect. Uh, if you're applying for a grant or if you're just thinking about getting into gardening, I would say, you know, do your groundwork if you can, can forgive the pun. Uh, so, you know, do your research, find out who your local garden centers are. If you've got local garden groups, you know, talk with them. Try to gauge volunteer support. Are you going to have, you know, parents who are interested? Maybe grandparents are going to be interested. So do kind of teasers, like teaser trailers, um, just to to see if there's going to be buy-in. And uh, then look at your prices. What plants are available? What equipment are you going to need? Uh, and then, you know, think through changes to the original plan if you realize things aren't going to work. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So plans are great. I love them. I love short-term plans, long-term plans. Um, I just have in there parentheses write in pencil. So whether it's grant writing, gardening, or anything else, you know, some things are going to go right, some things are going to go wrong. Uh, so for example, we have, you know, our company has a really great firewall, uh, and it blocked the congratulations email from Kids Gardening. So we never heard back, and we didn't think we uh, had got the grant. You know? Then luckily they called us and asked if we were ever going to accept the grant, and uh, we found the email buried and had been blocked as, as spam or, or filtered out, uh, so we were able to accept that. And then uh, actually, funny story, getting set up for this today, uh, just trying to get an email where we got our, our panel invitation, same thing. So we have a really good firewall. Uh, and then there's a program out here called Master Gardeners, and so we were hoping we would get some interest there. Um, we didn't end up getting any interest from Master Gardeners. I tried in three counties, but we found out that one of our uh, personal assistants in the company was actually a former program director. And then we found a, a local garden center that gave us some advice and made it easy for us to do purchases. And we had a local group that uh, the Butler County Conservation District, they gave us water barrels, uh, which turned into a bit of a lengthy process so we got a way to collect water and tie in with our, our lorax conservation theme uh, but we had to figure out how to do it the right way and it, and it became pretty complicated and then pretty early on uh, we figured out and started to learn that strawberry towers work really well in cooler climates they don't work very well in kansas uh, and then we had some staff turnover and we had last year a really kind of weird weather in kansas we had a, a very cold wet spring and then it was 90 degrees overnight. So we kind of missed some of what would normally be that, that growing season for young plants. Can we go to the next slide? So here's just some images. Uh, what The sign is one that uh, Amy did for the Augusta Center, and it was kind of just that, that coming attraction. Uh, and then we've got the one of the gardens in action. We've got a, a child just having some fun uh, with a miniature wheelbarrow we found. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, just for interest of time, I'm not going to read through the whole list, but we these are just the benefits we noticed. Uh, you know, kids are going to learn patience, which can be good and bad. They're going to be watering every day. So, uh, and then, you know, I've helped with some of the planting at, at multiple centers now, and you plant them in the ground, and you say, okay, this is going to turn into vegetables. And so I've had lots of kids ask me, and they kind of look down at the ground, and they're like, when? So the timeline for them is uh, something they have to get adjusted to. Can we go to the next slide? 
And then there were some downsides. Uh, so we, I chose this picture. Uh, so this was at our El Dorado Center. We got the rain barrel uh, donated. And then we've always worked with this owner. It's always been really easy to, to do building adjustments and things like that. We said, can we tie this rain barrel into the, the gutter system? And this time the owner said no. Uh, so we owned this shed. And so we got the rain barrel. We had to hook it up to the shed. Uh, and then, you know, we had to add the uh, gutters to it. Uh, so, and then with that, once you've got, you know, the, the rain barrels, we learned we had to paint them. So at some point this year, we're going to do a, a project where the kids are going to paint them so they don't grow mold. And then you've got to know how to treat it. So that's something where, uh, you know, we thought we were doing something simple and it became pretty complicated. Uh, and then microclimates towards the bottom, I, I've got listed there. We did the same garden layout at two different centers. They're only 10 miles apart, but the gardens grew pretty differently just because of how you know shade trees sit and how uh, soil might be a little bit different. So um, that's an example where you know things are, are going to get more complicated. Can we go to the next slide? All right, we're going to switch seats, so Amy's going to take over now. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we hear you. OK, so the picture on the left is um, at our Dr. Seuss event that we had where we're reading the Lorax book. Um, and that's kind of where we got them excited about what um, we were getting ready to do. Um, and again, the middle, um, the other pictures are a picture of our gardens early on. And what we found out is that um, kids planted seeds in different pups. And then we have them into the. Hey, Amy, you're going in and out just a little bit. Um, okay, so basically, the kids, is that better? Yes, that's better. Okay. Um, so, in the middle picture, kind of um, at the bottom of the picture, shows where a watermelon plant started to grow where we thought was carrots. So, that was fun for the kids to see that um, they planted a seed in the wrong cup, but it was fun for them to see that the carrots or that the watermelon grew where we didn't expect for it to grow. Um, and then the top right picture is a picture of a garden that we added into where the teachers got excited and brought some different things that um, they had at home just to expand our garden a little bit. And then just a picture of a basil plant that really worked well in our garden this year. Next slide, please. Um, so this is another picture of our garden where you can kind of see our truffle of trees that didn't go well. Um, and I think this year we're excited to make those into different flowers and see if we can get that to grow um, differently. Um, Uh, so we are doing, you know, year two, and I liked this picture here. It's kind of like you can, can look at it. You see all the stuff in the front uh, that went well, and so you can focus on everything that went well, or we could have focused on the the truffle of trees in the background and said, well, the strawberries didn't work. Um, but you know, the kids had fun and learned quite a bit from it, uh, and we're going to try to adapt them for year two. Can we go to the next slide? So just final tips. Um, as a, I'm a central office person, so I go out and visit all of our different centers. Uh, you know, that means I'm making probably 40 to 50 trips between all the centers, but each center is going to see me not often. But uh, if you're the one doing the planning for lots of different centers, keep it simple for them. Like this picture, we've got marigolds, we've got tomatoes, and we've got basil. If you plant those three together, they're synergistic plants, so it's going to go uh, pretty well. And it's a, you know, kind of a basic fact, but don't make your, your teachers be the ones to, to find that out. Um, and so try not to offer too many choices either. Like you don't want to button it down and tell every center what to do, but uh, also too many choices can be overwhelming and then it becomes too, a lot of stress for them to, to try to plan it. So try to work ahead. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, get parents involved early. Parent buying is going to be great. Uh, they can be a source of volunteers and they're, if they're interested in it, kids will be interested in it. And then just start small. Remember with uh, kids in, in younger age groups especially, basic can be magic. Uh, doing something like this, sticking a seed in the ground and having it turn into a plant, uh, that's a, 
a huge thing for them, like just seeing something, you know, without even uh, a plan or, or anything beyond that, uh, that for them can be the magic uh, and is going to teach them some science. And then, you know, utilize what's there, what events you have that you can tie into uh, so you're not creating the wheel from scratch. And utilize your local knowledge and, and kind of turn your feet and have a, a plan B. Okay, so we are, are all done. So. Um, so I'm going to turn over thank now. Thank you. To yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Kim and, uh, Amy and Andrew. That was really great. And that was really great insight of just about, you know, just certain things that can go on at a program level and how to kind of overcome some of those barriers. So that's really exciting. Um, and i uh, love to see the pictures of your Lorax garden. It looks great. But thank you guys both so much. Um, we're going to move on to the next program spotlight um, from the Early Sprouts Institute from Lynn. Um, Lynn, uh, you are good to go. All right, thank you. Um, I'm really glad to have this opportunity to tell people about Early Sprouts, which is a seed to table preschool um, approach to nutrition in the classroom. Um, it was developed here in New Hampshire back in 2006 and since then has been used across the country by a variety of different preschool centers. Next slide, please. So the program was developed when we were starting to hear a lot about the obesity epidemic and particularly about the impact it was having on young children. Um, and the realization was that we need to talk about nutrition in early childhood rather than waiting until later. And the preschool years are a very sensible time to do this because there's several things that happen at the age of three. One is that children start to really be influenced by social and environmental cues. So they hear messages like, um, there are certain foods that are celebration foods. You go to a party and you have cake and ice cream, and there's certain foods that are kind of punishment foods. You have to eat vegetables because they're good for you, or your parents are on a diet and all they can eat is salad. Um, they also are influenced by marketing of a lot of unhealthy foods. Also at the age of three, we start to see something called food neophobia kicking in. And this means a fear of new foods. And this goes back to our hunter-gatherer background where we had to be cautious about the foods that we were gathering because we didn't want to eat something that was poison. And um, unfortunately, the flavor that is most commonly associated with poison is bitterness, which is also a flavor that we see in vegetables a lot. So there um, is this inborn caution around bitter foods and un unknown foods that kicks in around the age of three. And unfortunately, when people are dealing with three-year-olds who tend to be suddenly very picky eaters after having been infants and toddlers that ate everything, um, people try different approaches like forcing children to eat things or um, bribing them to eat them or tricking them into eating things. And unfortunately, this usually backfires in that children um, might eat the food at that time, but they don't develop a preference for it. So our goal was to find ways to actually change children's preference for the vegetables. And as Sarah talked about before, there's a lot of positive things that happen in gardens. Children just love to be in gardens and they love to cook as well. Um, so it seemed like a natural place to start teaching children about food and nutrition. So the curriculum was developed here at Keene State College by a partnership between our early childhood education department and Carrie College, who is a dietitian. Next slide, please. So we had some basic goals. We wanted to teach children about basically where their food comes from. We wanted to increase their preference for the vegetables that we were working with. And we also wanted to be sure that we were work working on the family level to increase vegetable consumption in the home. So we do this by connecting children to the food supply by through this seat to table approach with a lot of hands-on experiences. We do it in a very positive social environment. Um, and what we do is we offer multiple exposures to certain target vegetables because the key to overcoming that food neophobia is to give a child repeated exposures to, to the foods that they're concerned about. So we have six target vegetables that are repeated four times over the course of the 24 week curriculum. And the vegetables were originally chosen because they're relatively easy to grow. They grew well in New Hampshire and they involved a variety of different colors, different plant parts, and different nutrients as well. Next slide, please. I think that went backwards. We need to go forward. One more. 
Okay. So the first year we ran a, a pilot project with the preschool here at Keene State College. And then after that worked really well, we launched a three-year study to see, get some data on, as to how effective the program, program actually is. So we worked with some preschool centers that were our intervention center, centers. These were the centers where children were doing the Early Sprouts curriculum. And um, three of those were Head Start programs. And we compared them to six other centers, four of which were Head Starts. And these were children that were not getting any exposure to the Early Sprouts curriculum. So when we got started, we had some volunteer groups, we had some grant funding, and we had people come in and build the gardens. Next slide. But once the gardens were built, then the children were really taking the lead. Um, so they did all of the planting with some adult help, and they also did all of the harvesting. Now, most of the programs that we were working with at the beginning were school year programs, and so they, children were not in school during the summertime. And then we had a lot of help from families, from teachers, and from community volunteers. Um, and in those cases, there was a lot of garden maintenance and some harvesting that didn't take place by the children. Although when families were involved, they were invited to harvest and use whatever vegetables were ready when they were working with the gardens. Next slide. So the way the curriculum is set up, there's um, the week is broken up into three parts. The children start the week with a sensory exploration of that week's target vegetable. So that might be something like dissecting the vegetable, comparing that vegetable when it's cooked versus when it's raw. There are some seed saving um, activities. Children might use language skills to describe vegetables and, and that's part of that comparison piece as well. They might be looking at different colors of things like bell peppers come in a variety of different colors. And so children might be looking at how do these different colors taste? What's the difference in their texture, in their juiciness? The week then proceeds to an in-class cooking activity, also using that week's target vegetable. And again, children are doing most of the work. There's a lot of supervision by the adults in the room, but it's really amazing what even three-year-olds can do in the kitchen. And the recipes were developed with that in mind, involving a lot of tasks that can be done by preschool age children. And with the recipes, we wanted to choose um, a variety of different dishes. So they weren't just getting a pile, pile of boiled vegetables on their plate. We had things like charred quesadillas, um, bell pepper fried rice, uh, English muffin pizzas with homemade tomato sauce, glazed carrots, green bean wontons. Those are just some examples of some of the recipes that children were cooking. And then to bring in the family, please, because you can get children eating well in the classroom fairly easily in many cases, but in order for those healthy eating behaviors to last, you have to have some, a change happening on the family level as well. And that's where the family recipe kit comes in. So we would um, give children and families that week's recipe and send them home with many of the ingredients for that recipe for the family to prepare at home. And this was really fun for families and it was great fun for children because they've already cooked the recipe once. So this was their chance to kind of be the expert at the home and show their family how the cooking is done. Next slide. So to continue the family involvement piece, because as um, other people have mentioned throughout the webinar, this piece is so important. We have the recipe kits. We send home a tip sheet for the family with advice and guidance on how to talk to children around the foods that they're trying and cooking at home. A lot of our centers um, have a dedicated early sprouts bulletin board or newsletter where there's photos of their kids in the garden or pictures of them cooking, the recipes, um, quotes from the children about their sensory exploration activities. As I said, we like to get the families involved in garden maintenance as much as possible. And there's been a variety of different family events that different centers have used. For example, um, the picture on the left you're seeing is one of the Head Start centers having a butternut squash pancake breakfast, where the cook actually prepared the recipe and invited families to come in um, and have breakfast with their children using that recipe. They, uh, there was a stone soup lunch where families would bring in one ingredient and they'd all cook so stone soup together. Um, Cooking with Dad Day was another Head Start event that was very, very popular where the dads would come in and do that day's early sprouts cooking activity with their children, which was just so much fun for the kids and for their fathers. Um, and another Head Start did a cont container gardening workshop so that they could teach families who didn't have a whole lot of yard space how they could do some growing of things at home. Next slide. 
And Sarah talked about this a bit at the beginning of the webinar. Um, even though this is a nutrition program, it really is about so much more than nutrition. And some feedback that we heard early on when we were working with Head Starts was that, oh my goodness, you're asking me to do one more thing in my very, very busy day where I have to be meeting all of these different standards. Um, and we were able to help them understand that the garden activities and the cooking activities and the sensory activities all could fit into their preschool day because so many um, curriculum areas cross over with all of these activities. I mean, children have to be working together when they're doing cooking activities. They're doing digging in the garden for physical activity. There's endless opportunities for creativity or language and literacy. Children can go out and draw still lives, life in the garden. They can be describing things. Cooking is full of science, as is a garden. You think about the changes that take place when food is cooked versus the raw what's happening with weather and insects in the garden. And of course, cooking is also involves a lot of math, early fraction work, counting the number of scoops of things that are going into the bowl. So the possibilities for linking this to curriculum is pretty much endless. Next slide. So at the end of the three-year study, we um, gathered the data, and I won't go into painful detail about the slides that you're seeing here, but basically, we looked at, did this change children's willingness to try vegetables? And we saw that it did. We looked at, did it change children's preference for those vegetables? And again, we saw that it did for all vegetables except carrots. And really, more children liked carrots to begin with. So we didn't see a big change there. What you're all not seeing here is that we also looked at whether we were seeing an increase in vegetable consumption in the home. Um, and what we found was that particularly in the Head Start families, so these low-income families, we saw a significant increase in the number of vegetable servings that were being eaten by children at the home. Next slide. And we got a lot of feedback from families. A couple of quotes here. We heard a lot from people who were saying, yes, my whole family is eating better because of what we're doing here. Feedback from teachers. Preschool teachers aren't trained in nutrition, so this was a simple way for them to bring that nutrition education into the classroom. And we also heard a lot from teachers who said their own eating habits started to improve. Next slide. So some pieces of advice to finish up with. The vegetables we chose and the recipes we developed aren't magic. What really matters is the positive approach, the um, exploring the sensory exploring with senses and the repeated exposures. If your center um, has families with a different cultural background where different vegetables might, might make sense or your climate is different, then by all means, you should grow what works for you. It's important to be realistic, start small, everyone keeps repeating that. Um, what's really key is the teacher's attitude. Teachers have to be enthusiastic and they have to be adventurous. Even if you've never had Swiss chard before and you've never liked vegetables, you need to be excited with children about your opportunity to try Swiss chard. And if you don't like it, then you need to be very discreet about the fact that you don't like it. The piece we found that was magic was this phrase, you don't like it yet, you might like it the next time you try it. It acknowledges the child's dislike of the vegetable, but it plants the seed that they might like it again, or they might like it the next time because people's tastes change the more they try things. And this works for adults too. And we should never force children to try foods, not even a no thank you bite, not even a decorate your plate bite. Um, children should have the freedom to say no, but they should be encouraged in a very positive added atmosphere to try the vegetables. And if they don't want to taste it, we should be inviting them to explore it with all of their other senses because all of that counts as those repeat exposures. Next slide. So just some resources that we have. Our website is up there. Um, the actual curriculum is the Early Sprouts Cultivating Healthy Food Choices book that has the sensory activities and all of the recipes and a lot of background information um, and advice on building the garden. The Early Sprouts cookbook was developed with additional recipes for preschools that want to do some cooking in the classroom. And this includes um, how these recipes line up with CACFP meal patterns. And then we also have um, several online trainings if people want to learn more about healthy eating and, and physical activity in the classroom. And that's it for me. Thank you so much, Lynn. That was, that was incredibly helpful and informative. Um, that was great information, but I wanna make sure that we have time 
um, to address some questions. So um, I'll go ahead and pause here to go through some poll questions, but just remember to type in your questions into the question or chat box, preferably the questions box. Uh, we've had a few comments come in about just how excited people are to start their garden grants pro programs, which is really great, um, and I appreciate those comments. So I'm gonna move to the next uh, poll question that we have, which is how likely are you to plan edible garden in your center? Um, one second, let me launch this poll. It just helps us gauge a little bit of interest. Um, so it's open now. It looks like about 65 to 70% are very likely, 20% um, somewhat likely, uh, and then the rest is already have an edible garden. Great. That's really positive feedback. I'm going to go ahead and close that. Thank you, everyone. And then I just want to mention, um, I know we talked a little bit more about, a little bit previously about um, the Kids Gardening Grants. I do want to mention that this initiative, the Grow More Gardens Grant Initiative, has two more rounds of garden grants. We just um, announced our first round of 2019 grants um, that we announced at our Parent and Family Engagement Conference in December. Um, so those programs are just now getting started with their planning and their community build days uh, starting in the spring, which is really exciting. Um, but we will be opening up our applications in this fall for the 2020 grants. Um, it'll be, you'll see lots of field messages from us. Um, if you're interested in learning a little bit more details and specifics, just let me know. My email will be provided at the end. Um, and I'm more than happy to get on the phone with you to talk a little bit more about it. But we do encourage you to apply. Um, it's a really exciting opportunity. Um, we, uh, we provide 10 garden grants um, each round through the support of Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation. Uh, it includes $5,000 of funding, but a lot of other materials from Kids Gardening and Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation to help you get started in your garden. So stay tuned for more information on that. Next poll I have is, uh, do you plan to apply for the next round of grants? I'll go ahead and launch this poll. Again, it will be open sometime in the summer and fall. We'll be, give you about two months or more to um, actually apply for the grant, and then we will hopefully make the announcement before 2020 is over. Looks like 75% of you guys are saying yes. Um, some of you guys are saying no, about 9%, and then about 20% are saying not this year, but in the future. That's great to know. Go ahead and close that. Thank you guys so much. Glad you most of you are interested. Um, and then I will let um, Sarah explain a little bit more about the support resources from Kids Gardening, Sarah or Helen, but I do want to say that we have um, on our website a link to all the Kids Gardening resources um, <clears throat> as well. But Sarah or Helen, do you want to um, talk a little bit more about those resources? Sure, I can just say, um, just real quick, I on the handout that we've provided today, we have a lot of um, a lot of resources listed, but this has even more, both for edible, non-edible, um, curriculum links, uh, lesson plan links, just kind of a, we tried not to overwhelm you with every link we've ever seen, but really just try and pick out some of the best, um, most helpful resources. So please check it out and, and scroll through the links to for more information. Great, thank you so much. So now I just want to go into some of the questions that we have. Um, I do want to clarify, we've had a few questions. Um, the handout to this PDF uh, for this webinar is included on your toolbar. So just make sure you download that um, as well as the resource handout from Kids Gardening. Um, and then we have had a couple of questions about um, how to strengthen your application for future Grow More Garden Grants. Um, I would definitely encourage you to attend our future webinars. And here is the webinar schedule on the next one. I'll go ahead and leave that up there. Um, and a bunch of, uh, a couple of people have actually asked, um, how can we receive feedback from our previous grants? Um, I'm more than happy if you follow up with me, I'm more than happy to talk on the phone with you guys, um, see if there's uh, some any other support that we can provide or guidance. Um, but I definitely encourage you to just make sure you attend the next uh, webinars and um, just keep in touch with us as uh, we can try to support you moving forward. Um, and then let's see, if there are any other questions, um, I will stay on just a minute here, just to make sure we receive the rest of them coming in, if anyone else has any others. All right. And then I do want to mention that we have a follow-up survey. Um, it's really helpful for us to understand um, what you liked most about this webinar, um, speakers, content, things like that, so we can um, kind of do our own internal continuous quality improvement and always try to make sure we're meeting the needs of our field. So uh, we'd love any and all feedback. So please, please fill out this feedback survey that you will get tomorrow. Um, 
and an email that will come as a post webinar email 24 hours after this webinar. Um, and you will be able to access the recording of this webinar and uh, download a certificate to show your completion of this one hour webinar that you can use for uh, PD credits or something like that. So I'm not seeing any other questions come in. I'm going to double check. So lots of thank yous um, and lots of excited comments. That's really great to hear. Are there any last comments from any of our speakers today before we sign off? I would just okay. like to say thank you for everyone for attending. Um, and please, you know, contact us if, if you have any additional questions as you get into the garden. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, thanks, everyone, um, from our program highlights today and Kids Gardening and Scott's Miracle Row Foundation. Uh, please go to our website, and you can peruse a little bit more about the resources there. And um, we will update it with when we have um, more dates about our future garden grant um, applications, when they're open and when they close. And uh, please email me, um, Sarah Neal. That's one of my emails there, gardens at nhsa.org. Please email that if you have any questions at all um, about the Grow More Garden Grants Initiative or any of our webinars. Uh, so thank you guys so much, and I hope you have a fabulous rest of your day.